So I'm Rafael, uh, I'm a professional programmer and I've been making games since I was a kid. Uh, and I've always been in super interested in alternate alternative tools to make games. I made my first games with PowerPoint, so very much not a, uh, a usual tool to make games. Uh, and ever since then, I've tried to make games with everything I could, I could stumble on them. Uh, and Puzzle Script is uh, such a tool uh, that is fairly uh, easy to use and pretty accessible. We'll go over some of its basic features. So we will uh, see how um, how fun and easy it is to get in. Uh, and yeah, I hope you will enjoy it as much as I do. <laughs> uh, so I am now sharing my screen with you all. Bam. OK. So. Uh, so the way this workshop is gonna work is uh, that we're like gonna go over some of uh, puzzle script main features to um, to a, a presentation, uh, but we're also gonna alter we're also gonna switch with um, working in the engine. Uh, we're gonna slightly modify a project that already exists to familiarize ourselves with the features that I will go over. Um, and uh, to be able to leave that workshop and make our own games or make, make our own modifications to game that already exists. So introduction to Puzzle Script, a game dev tool for so command games. Now I'm sure one question you might have if you don't already know is what is a so command game? Uh, so Sokoban uh, was a very cool uh, Japanese puzzle game in which uh, you would move on a grid and you would push crates and uh, get them to target. And that was it. So a Sokoban game is just a game that draws inspiration from the original Sokoban, uh, just like a roguelike draws inspiration from Rogue draw inspiration from Rogue, and uh, all all those other games. Uh, and so yeah, any game in, in which you have grid-based movement and you just push and pull around stuff would be considered a Sokoban game. Um, so puzzle script. Uh, so puzzle script is a tool that is very good at making one type of game. So in this uh, in this instance. Um, Sokoban games. So it has an advantage that like everything is, uh, you, you get everything to make the Sokoban game of your dream. Like every functionality is there. It's not like in Unity where you would have to build some stuff from scratch. Uh, however, it has the disadvantage that anytime you want to make something that is a little bit more out of the box, you will either um, work a lot, like it, it would be a lot of hard work to make it work, or it might just straight out be impossible in some cases. But it still allows for a lot of possibility, and there is some fun to be found in um, in finding how to circumvent those uh, limitations. So I don't think that's an issue in the long term. You just got to make sure it's the right tool for the game you're making. Uh, it's also it's a free online tool. There is no programming programming required whatsoever. There, there are rules that we're gonna have to write, uh, but we're very far from having to learn an actual programming language. It's pretty easy to learn. Uh, you can export our project in HTML in a single click. It's super easy. It takes like five seconds to download. And so afterwards, you can pass your game around, make your friends play. You can put it on your website, on, on itch, anything. So it's very portable. Most games are hackable. More on that later. But basically, what it means is that for most games, you can click on a button and you'll be able to get its source code and modify it yourself, which is good for learning or for modifying a game you like. There is a built-in level editor. Again, more on that later. We will go back to it. Don't worry. Uh, but all of these characteristics make it a super, super accessible tool. You can hardly get more uh, more accessible than Puzzle Script. Uh, and that's what makes it such an exciting tool to use. So now 
let's try out a puzzle script game just to uh, get an idea of like what it looks like, what it's possible to do with. So this is what uh, we get to when we go to the puzzle script uh, homepage. Uh, so we can just make a game for steps. We have some games in the gallery, so we're gonna go make a game. So we can make we can make our own, but here we're gonna load one of the we're gonna load one of the uh, um, default examples. So here we go try uh, microban by uh, David David Skinner. David Skinner. Uh, if you want, you can follow along. You can uh, like open up that page and and uh, Try to do the same things that I will do, but it's really not necessary. 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 We're not gonna make a lot of stuff, and like, frankly, like most of the game is already there. So yeah. So we're just gonna try to see what can be made with puzzle script. So here you see level one of them. Okay. So yeah, that's. I chose microban because it's really a typical Sokoban game. There are a lot of more creative puzzle script games out there that do lots of fancy stuff, but this is a very vanilla puzzles, a van very vanilla Sokoban game, so it, it's good to get an idea of what the genre is and what the engine can do at, at its core. So I move around, and this little character right here, I can push those crates. Uh, if I push them uh, in a corner, I cannot uh, retrieve them anymore, so we can press R to reset. And basically, the goal of this puzzle is just to get those crates uh, on the, those two circles, two black circles that you see here. They're the, the targets. So here, we start like that. So what we're going to do is, like, I'm just going to go over the solution real quickly. This, that. And once I get all my boxes on the crate, cool, I finish a level, next level. I'm not gonna do all 10 levels, but that's just to show you a little bit what can be done. Cool, now level three of 10. So this one starts to be a bit more interesting. Uh, I'm probably not gonna finish it because like, I found the solution yesterday, but it's a bit uh, tricky. So because if I do that, like if I go place the first box, now I don't have any way to place a second box. And if I do it, uh, the other way around, if I place this box first and then try and place the other box, I have the same problem. So you have to do some weird manipulation to like place it. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, that's not it. No. Anyway, we're not going to finish it because that is not the point. The point was just to show you what can be done with it. Uh, and yeah. So we're going to dive in right into um, how to start out, how to make. Um, I don't know if I'm going too fast, actually. Like, don't hesitate. I'm just going to check quickly. No, OK. No one is. Uh, oh, thanks for putting the link. So yeah, OK, no one is panicking at me going too fast. But yeah, don't hesitate, hesitate if I do. So yeah. So. What we're going to start with is the most basic thing in Puzzle Script. It's the objects. So the objects are, are the building blocks of our game. That's what that's what everything in the game that we see is, every entity, the player, the boxes, the target. So if I go back to my game here, like that little character here, that's an, that's an object. Those create two, those target. Um, the, the background is an object. The walls are an object. Like, Every little, every little thing, every little square is a different kind of object. Uh, and so we got to start our game by declaring those objects. Uh, so you have to follow the following format. So first, you put the name of the object. So like here, we see box or we see player. Then the color, uh, you can use only one color if you want, or you can use multiple color. So the color, that, the color names that the colors that gonna um, make up your game. So you can either use a color name; they're listed in the documentation. I'm not gonna go over them, but like some basic color like brown, black, orange, white, blue uh, are there. Um, but there might be like turquoise is not there. Like there, there aren't every possible 
color uh, that are there. Um, so basically, there are some names that you can put. And you can also just straight out write the hexadecimal code. So we're not going to go over that, but basically, Google Color Picker um, and whatever hexadecimal code they give you, you, you can put it here, and it's going to work too. Um, and so, so you have to declare those two lines. So the name of your object, it's color or colors. And optionally, you can also, like here, put a five by five representation of the object's asset. All objects in Puzzle Script are uh, five pixel by five pixel. There uh, is not really a way to change that. Um, there are some workaround you can find, but like by default, it's five by five. Uh, so, um, here, how it's made up is that uh, each number represents a color. It refers back to the color we declared here, um, starting at zero. So black is zero, orange is one, white uh, is two, and blue is three. Uh, and whenever I put a dot, it's just an empty space. So if there is a background behind, like, uh, like here, my guy, I'm going to see like just behind, like you see those two, one, two dots here, like, okay, this is not going to be colored, like it's just going to be, it's just going to be transparent. Um, and if uh, you put nothing, if you don't put, uh, if you don't take the time to uh, write a five by five uh, character, well, five by five asset, it's just going to be a plain square like this. Um, and very important, you always need an object player. Like afterwards, you can have whatever objects you want in your game. Uh, you can, yeah, like it can be whatever, but you always need an object player. Otherwise, your game is not going to know uh, like what to move when you press arrows. Uh, and like you cannot name it any other way. It cannot be like character. It cannot be protagonist or like if you're character is named Mario, it can't be Mario, it really has to be named player. This is something that is uh, hard coded. So here in my um, in my objects in this game, I can see I have like all these, like okay, the background, like this is this is what it looks like. I have the targets, the wall, and you see they always use like basic color, but I can like go here and add books. Uh, like a box and make it round, and now we will have a new object. And if I want my box to look a certain way, I would need to do like this, this. I don't know why I would want it to look that way, but like if ever. But we can also, like in this case, we're just going to put nothing and just make it a plain square. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's it for the object. They're, they're gonna be, we're gonna refer to them later in our code to make up rules, to make up maps and stuff like that. Uh, but that's every pieces we're gonna be able to use in our game. Now we have the legend. Uh, so the legend is uh, a place where we assign a symbol for each of the objects we created here. Um, so all objects need uh, all objects need a symbol. Uh, they will be used to build levels. So we're not gonna cover that until the very end of the workshop. So you will have to uh, bear with me. But yeah, trust me that these will be useful later. And the symbols can be whatever character you want. Like you can see here, they don't use they don't just use letters. They also use a lot of uh, special characters. So you can do that. Like here, this is what we have, and you can have. A, a, you can have a symbol that, that represents two objects at the same time. Like when we restart our game, you can see that like this here up is this symbol, this add symbol. Uh, so this is a crate and a target that are generated on the same file. Um, but yeah, anyway, we're not going to cover that more until later. But just know that you have this legend here. It will be useful later. Um, now we have the collision layers. So the collision layers are basically the order in which your objects will be drawn. 
Uh, so this is the 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 objects that are the most at the background and the most at the foreground. So that's it. Um, so here you can see that we draw the background. So that's why we see a green square here, and then uh, the target, and then the crate. Um, and here also you see the target is above the the background. So it's a way to for the engine to know in which order to draw objects, but it's it also serves an even more important purpose, which is knowing which objects collide together. So objects that are on the same line, uh, like here, player, wall, and crate, they're all on the same line of code. Uh, these objects, they cannot overlap. Uh, so again, here, like my player can overlap with the background without any problem. It can overlap with the target too, no problem here. Uh, however, it cannot overlap with the wall. If I like right now, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to go down, and I can't. There's a wall, and player and wall are on the same line. Uh, same thing if uh, I try to go on a crate. Like here, I go down, and I can go on the crate, uh, and a crate cannot go on a crate. Like I can, I can push it toward a background, but I cannot push it toward a wall or another crate. So uh, normally you will have around three layers, like typically most games have that. They have the background, they have some things that the player can walk on, and they have some things that the player cannot walk on. Typically that's how it will go, but it can, like it's not a, a hard rule, uh, you can have other amount of layers. Uh, and you always, always need a background layer. Um, and it has to be named background, etc. cetera. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> sorry, otherwise uh, you're not, no, your, your game is not gonna compile. Uh, just one sec, I'm just gonna drink a bit of water. <sighs> it's a lot of talking. Cool. I'm back on track. So uh, now we get to the more complicated part of our workshop, uh, which are the rules. So the rules are really the meat of puzzle script. They're what describes the mechanics of our game. So if we don't have the rules like right now, like I just have a bunch of objects that I can place on the screen, but I don't really have rules. Um, the rules, the way they're written, now, now you will really have to bear with me and like this, uh, this is kind of hard to convey, but basically they are divided into two parts, the left hand side and the right hand side. Uh, like here you can see uh, in the examples I gave uh, uh, under um, under this, uh, you have like, for example, the left hand side is a player crate and like there's a little arrow in front of player and nothing in front of crate and the right hand side is this here. There's always an arrow, an arrow in the center that separates the left hand side from the right hand side. Uh, so like a dash followed by this symbol, I don't know its name, but yeah, so you always have that in between the two sides. Um, and what they represent basically is the left hand side is the pattern, the pattern the engine is going to look for. So in this case, in the case of the first rule that is written here, the pattern on the left side is the arrow in front of player means uh, moving towards. So a, play, a player moving towards, now this means like adjacent to. So uh, a player moving towards a crate that is adjacent to. So if we start here, like for example, when when I'll move to the left here, I'm taking, I will be a player that is effectively moving towards a, an adjacent crate. So uh, this is the pattern that my uh, engine is trying to recognize here. So when it does identify that patterns, it will do the thing on the right hand side. So here we will have, um, again, our player that is moving and the crate will be moving with, with them. 
So here, whenever I see a player moving towards a crate, I will replace that by a play player moving with a crate that's moving in the same direction. Boom. Um, yeah, so the left side always has to match what's on the right side. By that, I mean like uh, here I couldn't have um, like player crate and here player and then like absolutely nothing. Uh, I can uh, I can have a pattern such as the last one here, which is um, like having a player adjacent to a crate, uh, a player moving towards a crate it's adjacent to will become a player that's moving towards nothing. But here, notice I still have that vertical, vertical bar. Uh, that's what makes this correct. Uh, but if I remove that bar, that wouldn't be correct. It, it wouldn't see uh, that it has two equivalent uh, hands. Uh, hopefully, this wasn't too confusing. Again, I'm going to just quickly check if there is any question. OK. Um, so we will, don't worry, we will go into more. We will go into a lot of practical examples to really wrap our head around this concept. But yeah, I'm going to just uh, cover quickly the two other examples that I put here, and then we'll have a sort of little quiz. So what does it do if uh, I uh, move that row around, that it, instead of looking toward the right, it's looking toward the left? Well, the, the right row means moving towards. The left row means moving away from. So if I have a player moving away from a crate, uh, then I will have a player moving away from a crate with the crate. Uh, so we can see this here. Um, yep. Wait. So here, this was the first example. Like This is just a, a, a character pushing a crate. But here, we would have a player pulling a crate, uh, which is uh, useful in some cases. Uh, that might be what you want. This is not the original. Sokovan only included objects that you can push, but pulling can also uh, make up for interesting game mechanics. And here, uh, very different. Uh, but what this syntax means, what three little dots means, is basically uh, on the same line or or like which or like within sight. Uh, so, so if and like no matter the distance, so it doesn't have to be next to it. It's like, oh, if I have a crate that's on the same line as a player, uh, then that crate would will move towards the player. So you would you would basically uh, like be a crate magnet, I I guess. Um, okay, that's not what they cover here. But like here, for example, they do that with an eyeball instead of a crate. Uh, but basically, whenever you're on the same line, it moves towards you. Um, so that's interesting. At the end, it just looks like pulling when they're on, when they're like right next to each other. But you can see before that that whenever whoop, you pass in front of it, it will pursue you. Um, yeah. So now that we covered those basics, uh, let's. Let's try to guess what those do. So uh, what we will do is uh, try to guess them one at a time. Like for now, try to guess what the first one does. Uh, I'll give you, I'll say like 30 seconds to try to guess what it does, uh, and then I will tell you, then I will tell you what it does, and then we'll move on to the next. I will, I will give you. Uh, maybe even a minute, I don't know. I'll, I'll try to just give you 30 seconds for each of them. So I'm just putting myself a little timer on uh, on my phone, and here you go. You have 30 seconds to find out what the first line does. OK, it's been 30 seconds. So basically, what this will, would do is uh, it kind of combines uh, those two last rules. 
So basically, whenever there's a crate on the same line as a, as a player, that crate would get destroyed. Uh, I don't know if do you show that example in the documentation. Not really, but OK. Anyway, we just need to explain the behavior. Uh, now try to guess what this second line do. I can make a guess if no one has one. Sure. Um, so because there's three crates, then and then it says nothing, that would be when there's three crates together, they disappear? Yeah, exactly. Uh, which sounds weirdly like a match three game. Uh, <laughs> so you can you can make that in puzzle script if you want. Um, okay. Well, now same principle. Try to guess what the third line of code means. Uh, it it has a syntax that is that we have never seen, but I still want you to try to guess what it does. Okay. Uh, so this one I'm actually I'm not sure I remember correctly, but uh, we can test it quickly. That's the magic of puzzle script. We can just go and try out stuff. But I think what it does, before we go, I think what it does is basically um, if a player moves and a crate exists somewhere, like you see there's no, uh, there's no like, they're not in the same square brackets. There's not in, in a vertical line in between them. It's just, hey, if you have a player that moves and a crate, whatever that crate does, then move the player and do move the crate. So I think that all the crate would move with us. Um, but it's OK if we don't know in advance. We can just go here, replace the rule, and run it. And here we do new game. And yeah, all the crates move with us, no matter where we are in the, in the space. So that's cool. There's probably something nice to do with that. Uh, and the last rule, uh, okay, the last rule is really, has a really funny effect. Try to guess what it does. Yeah, it is tough. I'm trying to think. Okay, so the, the 30 second is over. Uh, you're gonna see it's pretty funny. So here, what, it will do is whenever we have a moving player, we will have a moving crate. So basically, as soon as we move, we turn into a crate. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, which is not very useful because, well, you cannot, like, right now I'm trying to move and I can't. Like, I'm, I'm a crate now. Uh, and a crate can't move. So we don't have any player on the map. So that's it. That's like, the end of the game, uh, so uh, be careful with rules like that. Um, oh yeah, I forgot earlier to add our box to uh, the legend. So like, let's be equal box. Cool. Now our box exists. That was the error here. Okay. Uh, and layer, it will be on the same layer as those, I guess. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, Okay, cool. Um, mm -mm -mm. Now, uh, super important too, because, okay, cool. Now we have, like, if we go into our game, uh, now we will have, like, objects that we can place on a map, and we can interact with those objects. Like, if I didn't write that rule, if I didn't have that rule at all, then, like, just nothing would happen. I could, like, move, but here I'm trying to push the crate, and it does nothing. Uh, but now we have objects, we have rules, we have stuff. So we, like, we're close to a game. The only thing is we haven't, we haven't defined how we finish a level. So like I could go around and push crates forever, uh, but like nothing is going to happen. Uh, and that's where, when we arrive to win conditions, so when conditions are like basically the condition that have to be met in order to finish a level, 
So uh, two things to keep in mind. First, all levels share the same conditions. So you, you cannot... Um, you cannot go beyond that. Like if you want to have, okay, I want a level with that kind of objects and the, the goal is to uh, put this object on this object, but then the level afterwards, you have to do the opposite and then you have to do this. Like, no, you cannot do that. All the levels share the same uh, conditions. So uh, you you are kind of limited by, by this, um, this constraint. Uh, you can have more than one condition in our little microband. Uh, we only have that one condition, which is all target on create. So all target must be on the same tile as a create. Um, but uh, we could have other conditions if we wanted. We could have, oh, you have to have all target on create and no bugs. Uh, right now we don't start with a bugs, but like if we decided to add a box, uh, or like in the case of, of our match three, it could be like like we did earlier. Like we could have a rule that is, oh, when you have three crates uh, together, the, then you have no crate at all. And the rule could be to have no crate. Uh, and like, you can, do, you can do things like that. But yeah, you can stack up several conditions. The format is always as polo, it's always no all sum object one on object two. On object two is optional, you don't need it. But yeah, basically, so it's always no all sum something on something two. Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, this one is from Neko Puzzle. So that's another, uh, that's another default uh, project. Yeah, sure. So um, it's a game in which like, you are a, uh, a cat eating fruits, and uh, the level finished when you have eaten all fruits. Wow, I feel. Um, so here, the condition to finish level in Nico puzzle is when there's no fruit left. So no fruit. Uh, in Sokoban, so basically in Microban, uh, you win when all target uh, have a crate on it. So all target on crate. Uh, and those conditions, those are from the, the um, puzzle script documentation. They're, they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily refer to a game in particular, but yeah. So you could win if some love exists somewhere. So love being an object that we would have defined in our code, uh, but it could be like some target, some fruit. So like as soon as this object exists uh, somewhere, you win. Um, if you win, it could be that you win if there's some some gold uh, on chest. Uh, so, yeah. So basically, it would be like some target on crate. Um, so yeah, as soon as one of your chest has gold on it, you win. Uh, where I'm gonna actually demonstrate that one with my coban, so it it's a bit clearer. Uh, but like for example here, I'm just gonna modify the level a little bit. Uh, here, like that. You don't need to understand how I modified it, but yeah. Here, so the win condition, if instead of all target and create, I do some target and create, uh, then it will be very different. I won't need to have my two crates on a target to win. As soon as one of them will be on a, a target, I'll win. That's it. I don't need both of them. I just need one of them. So some gold on chess. And uh, here you win if all gold gold has been taken from the chess. So no gold on chess. So you can really mix and match them however you want. And like I said, you can have several conditions for the same game. Um, yeah, hopefully that was clear. Um, and now we enter like pretty much, yeah, pretty much the final part of uh, Making, making our game because right now we have all the building blocks to make our game. We have, whoops, we have all the objects and we have all the rules and we have a way to win a game, but we don't have levels. Like right now we have levels because some levels came with it. 
Uh, but otherwise, if those levels weren't written, like we don't have a level. We have all our things to make our game, but we don't have the game. So how do we make a level? So there are two ways to do it in Puzzle Script. You can either type it out yourself. So remember the legend we defined earlier, like this is what we're going to use here to type out what our game is going to be. So each symbol represents an object, and you put it here. Uh, and Puzzle Script, the way it's going to work is, oh, it's see your first level, it's going to like load this one first. Uh, and it's not going to, you can ignore those lines. They're not necessary. They're just for the text that we put in between our level. But it's not mandatory to have text between level. But yeah, basically, as soon as I finish this level, it would then load the next one. And when I finish this one, it loads the next one. It's true. So it always do them like uh, like starting there and finishing at the end. Um, yeah. And personally, when I want to, yeah, yeah, when I want to test out levels, what I do is just I copy them at the start. So it's the first one to load. And when I'm satisfied with it, I put it back to its place. Um, so yeah. Uh, very important that all of your lines have the same amount of characters. Uh, Puzzle script really ex expect rectangle maps uh, from you. So here, for example, if I removed this one dot here, if I save, save and run, uh, it's gonna give me a bunch of warnings. Mac maps must be rectangular. Yo, I don't know why it writes yo, but yeah. So in an in level, the length of each row must be the same. So that's really, really important. Uh, otherwise, like sometimes it will work. Well, I think this showed us the last function in level. Um, but yeah, sometimes it will work, but most of the time it's not. So just have rectangle level. So here I have six characters by line. Every time I add a new line, it must have six characters. Again, I'll drink. So yeah, uh, so basically that's how you create it that way with text, but it might be a bit more interesting to have a more visual approach because I don't know for you, but when I write a bunch of characters like that, I have a hard time figuring out what my level is, what my level is actually gonna look like. Uh, so you can also just press E to open up the level editor. So here, look at this. Whoop, I'm just gonna do this actually. Yeah, okay. So look at this, I press E, bam, level editor. So in the level editor, I have all the objects that I defined here. And I can do like, whoop, I have this, okay, I want to have that instead. Uh, I cannot have multiple player. Um, I have create. So I can, I can really do whatever I want with this. Uh, and then when I'm satisfied with what I made, obviously I'm not like this is garbage, uh, but like if I were satisfied with what I made, I hit S here. So this is printing the level in the console. Uh, so then I can just copy it and paste it in my levels here. And that way when uh, I run my project, you, you're gonna see we are, well, are starting in that project, and you can you can play as you are editing it. Uh, obviously, be careful because uh, like if I do this and I play and I do that, I put it in a corner like this. Uh, it can be hard to like get it back to the state I wanted, but still you can like kind of get an idea of what you're making uh, as you're making it, which is. Pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And if I want to add grid or rows to my level, I just have to click outside of my grid. If I click right next to it, bam, it adds a, a column, it adds a row. So like I can do that and expand my level a lot. I don't know what's the limit of lines you can add in that game. Uh, obviously, like make it. Uh, manageable, like if you have a super giant puzzle, you might bore your player. Uh, but there are some puzzle script games out there that uh, that have fairly 
big maps and like they're just not like filled with objects but they're super um, interesting and beware because uh, here this input like for example if i do that i'm like wow this is a very good level okay i'm gonna save it and i hit save and then i don't know like i do other things and and uh, and whatnot uh, then when I'm going to hit save and hit run, as soon as you hit run, uh, like your your history, your, your console history disappear. So if I was really happy with the level I made and, and it disappears, this is really going to uh, make me sad. So you really want to make sure that before you, um, before you run your project again, uh, you like you copy what you've saved and you put it here because otherwise you're gonna lose your progress. Um, yeah. So this is not like a a truly save button. It's just like an export to text and then use that text. Uh, so yeah. So this is the character presentation level, the level editor. I just so showed you that. So yeah, that's most of the basics of puzzle script. And now I'm gonna like give you a little like a, a brief overview of like um, what's to come and the limits of the engine. So the limits of the engine, uh, like there's a lot of stuff that puzzle script can do, but there's also a lot that it cannot and that you might want. Uh, it it cannot process diagonal directions. If you wanna do some things like Oh, when my character has a crate, like right, like to to the top left of it, like right di diagonally to it, um, puzzle script has no way to process that. It can only um, process horizontal and vertical um, actions. Uh, you cannot have movements that play out over many turns. Like you cannot be like, oh, like if I um, if I push a crate in two turns, it's going to do that. Or you cannot, you cannot have things like that. Um, or be like, oh, if I push a crate, it's going to go left and then up and then up and then right. Right. I don't know why you would do that, but like you, you get the idea. Like you cannot have things like that. Um, puzzle script has no variable, no, no counter or things like that. So like there would be no way to process that in that engine. You cannot really have real-time behaviors. I, I've seen games with sort of real-time behaviors. So I, I'm not sure how they attain that, but yeah, it does seem the documentation. Like there's not really real-time behaviors. Um, there is barely any randomness. There is technically randomness, but it's like more or less advanced and it's not super well supported. But anyway, I wouldn't recommend it. Like in a puzzle, uh, in a puzzle game, randomness is just super frustrating. So I can have characters that move in the opposite direction as me. I can have copycat. I can have those can be interesting. But have a character that have an obstacle that moves randomly every turn, uh, that's just annoying. Uh, like there's nothing to do with it. Um, so yeah. You cannot really have branching. I honestly don't know why you would want that anyway, but like you cannot have uh, things like, oh, if you finish a level that way, then you go to level A, but if you finish the level this other way, you can go to level B. Uh, as you can see, like there is a way to put text in between, um, in between levels and sometimes people put a bit of narrative in between in between those levels. So in that sense, I can see why some people would like to do that, but like narrative and branching narrative is really not what Puzzle Script was made to do. Like there are very more well-suited engine like Twines and stuff like that to do that if it's something you want. Uh, and yeah, basically anything it's not meant to do, even if it's a very basic simple, like a very basic, feature you can think of. Uh, if it's not something Puzzle Script was meant to do, well, there's no way you're going to be able to put it there. And that's that's one um, that's one disadvantage of using something in which you cannot code. It's like, it's like if some behavior doesn't exist, it just cannot exist. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's how it is. Um, so now uh, I'm going to give some game recommendations uh, for two purposes, for fun first. I think those are all amazing games uh, that, that I've included, uh, but also for reference. Uh, because like I said, like uh, the, the Sukkoman game I've showed you is a very, very basic one, but there are some, and you might think it's dull. I don't think it is. I think uh, vanilla Sukkoman games are super cool, uh, but you, you, like if you think this is all this engine can do, you would be highly mistaken. It can do other games. It can do games that are vastly different and very exciting, very uh, visually interesting or like more twisted or like, so there's a lot of things you can do. So I would recommend to uh, maybe not finish, but take a quick look at each of these games. So uh, you get an idea of what the engine can do and maybe you get some ideas for your own games. Um, so I'm not going to go over each one of them. Anyway, I'm going to like share the slides uh, with you at the end. And like you can, um, you'll be able to use this document as a reference. Uh, I just want to really put the emphasis on Spooky Pumpkin Game, because not only is it a, a good puzzle script game, so a good example to see how uh, the engine works, and it's also pretty simple. It's not a basic Sokoban, but almost. Uh, but it's really, really an excellent example on puzzle progression. Uh, like, we didn't cover puzzle design in that workshop. That's way outside of the scope of uh, this workshop. But if you want to learn a little bit about puzzle design, first I recommend doing some readings out there, but also like just playing that game and really really uh, deconstructing it and seeing what it does is good for that. It follows the structure of one level to show a new mechanic, one level to make sure you understand the working of this new mechanic, and one level, and one level to challenge you on that mechanic, uh, which is a very common uh, pattern in puzzle design. And it's, it's a great one. It makes for an enjoyable experience for the player in which you don't have to explain the rules for them to be understood. Uh, and as a bonus, there's a drop down menu to select any level, no matter uh, how far you've progressed into the game. So again, something very good for learning uh, how to do it. And all those games are hackable, by the way. So I said we would go back over that. So what this means is just when I, I load the game, uh, at the bottom, there's a little button that reads hack this game. If I click on it, bam, I get the source code for the game. So it's really great. I would say that most puzzle script games have, have this. Uh, some don't. I don't know how they do that. And like I'm not interested to know how to make a non-hackable game, because I'm really too into open source and all. I personally make all my puzzle script games hackable. So like, if anyone wants to want to modify it for whatever reason, they can. Uh, but yeah, so this makes for a great reference document and great learning experience. There's a lot of stuff, but like still, and yeah, but if only just for the puzzle design, I think that this game is worth it. And like for any other game, you can click and like, hack and like, that's cool. Uh, I really appreciate that uh, puzzle script creator, uh, Stephen Level uh, included that this is built in, in, in puzzle script. Now those are other game recommendations, uh, those are not hackable. So they, they cannot uh, be used as like a reference document. Like you cannot use them to learn how to um, write a puzzle script game. However, I think they really show a good diversity of what can be done with puzzle script. Um, so you have this one that I discovered by accident the other day that's super cute. It's a four levels game or oh, that follows a classic uh, narrative structure of, of the same name. So anyway, those are like kind of like they're very different. They're those two are more narrative driven and all. And I don't know. I, again, I'm not gonna go into details uh, about those, but they're really really good and different, and I really love them. Uh, oh, and one quick note: like most of those games are made by creators that may, that are kind of prolific. Like Spooky Pumpkin Game uh, was made by the guy who did uh, Skipping Stones to Lonely Homes, I think. 
and like he makes like a lot of games in puzzle script and Anna Anthropy, I don't know if she does a lot of puzzle script games, but she makes a lot of cool games with a lot of alternative tools. Uh, and she wrote a really great book on how to use puzzle script that I highly recommend if you want to uh, push your puzzle script game further. Um, so what there are other some basic features that we didn't cover, but, but that you might want to check out uh, after these workshops. Um, so I, I think that Honestly, I think that what we, what with what you have right now, you have everything that's necessary to make a very enjoyable Sokoban game. Uh, but you might want to, in the future, have more freedom to make more complex games or games with other mechanics. So those are all things that I uh, recommend checking out. Uh, you can easily like I've uh, like you can click on them. I've always put the, the related documentation. To them to make your search to make your search easy, but yeah, basically it's not an engine that has a lot of stuff. Like we covered all of the basic, and like those are other stuffs to cover, and like there's not much more beyond that. Uh, it's really how you're gonna uh, put those pieces together that's gonna make for like that's gonna make a design space um, a big design space possible. But um, like that's most of puzzle script and that's what's so great is that you have very little to learn in order to like kind of master it uh, and yeah uh, that's pretty much it so what now like you just had a uh, one hour workshop on how to use this fantastic engine um, but what can you do from there so uh, you, I advise, and you can do these in pretty much any order you want. Uh, there's not one good path to learn. Uh, so you can play some games for inspiration. So obviously the one, the ones that I recommended earlier, but also check out the the homepage on PuzzleScript uh, and the gallery, and of course the example projects uh, that are included. So like on the homepage, seriously, I discovered a lot of very, very great games just by, they always showcase three different games when you load the page. And I've like, oh, this is one of the games that I recommend. So this is a way that I discovered this game. So I've always discovered super cool game just going that way. So yeah, you don't have to work hard to like, curate games for puzzle script. Um, so I recommend playing some games for inspiration. I recommend also obviously hiking some games, trying to like kind of reverse engineer them. Uh, read carefully their code. So like try to understand what's going on. Uh, like this will help you tremendously in uh, understanding rules and like the structure of the program. Uh, what I'll do, like some of them can have a pretty dense code. Like, I don't know if you paid much attention earlier, but like when I showed the code of Spooky Pumpkin Game, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't need to understand every single line. Um, like, just try to understand the basic. If there are some things you don't understand, that's fine. Um, like, just move on. Uh, as long as you uh, take something away from uh, reading that game that's good and see what happens if you slightly modify some rules. Uh, this will really help you get a, a good understanding of uh, what you've been reading and what uh, can be done with the engine. Like if you just slightly modify the rules, you're going to understand like, oh, this, this has uh, this kind of behavior and this can do this kind of emergent gameplay. Like it's really going to help you uh, learn how rules work. Um, and then obviously make your own game, make mistakes, learn. Uh, I, I come from a very experimental experimental game development background. So I am used to make lots of game, make lots of very bad game and, and not uh, caring about it. So like don't hesitate to um, dive into, into uh, the game development and like, make whatever you can and if it doesn't work it's fine it doesn't work like you can always find uh, you know, like you can always find something to do with it and that's it or sometimes you're gonna write out some rule and it's not gonna do the thing you meant it to do but it's still gonna do something interesting and like you can either like you can either abandon it and 
try to write your rule so that it does what you actually had in mind. Or you can maybe use that rule to make something else, to make another game or to make another mechanic in your game. So yeah. Finally, read up the documentation, obviously. Uh, that will help you, help you review the basics that we've seen today. Like if you go in the documentation, uh, in the section bird's eye view of a puzzle script file, this basically goes over everything you've seen today, like ignore sounds, this is a bit more advanced, but like it basically goes over everything you've seen, we've seen today. It has good examples, it has very clear, crystal clear explanation. Um, so yeah, so you can, you can read the documentation to review the basics that you just learned and to learn also more advanced features uh, as, as seen here. Um, but I really recommend doing more hands-on hands -on stuff first. Like, if I were you, the first thing I would do is hack a game. I think that would be like the more practical approach and the thing I would learn the most from. Obviously, you know yourself better than I do. Uh, we all learn in different ways. But like, you had enough theory as it is today, and now if you just read more, like, it's not you're not gonna keep all that information in your head uh, before you dive into a game. Like you should start doing more practical thing. Uh, but yeah, other than that, do, do those things in any order you see fit. And um, yeah, go and enjoy making some great games. Yeah, so thank you so much. And I hope I'll see all of you at the gym. <laughs>